Okay, now I want to kind of change gears and talk a little bit about transparent materials, opaque materials, and what happens as light goes through various um, mediums. So if we were to think about um, mechanical waves for a second, if I had a tuning fork right here, if I were to hit it, then what's going to happen is this thing's going to start to vibrate. It's going to bounce into the air molecules that are right next to it. It's going to cause them to vibrate. They're going to vibrate actually at the same frequency. And we're going to have regions where they're pushed together, right here, the crests. There's going to be a trough right here in the middle. There's going to be a crest, trough, crest, trough, crest, trough, and so on and so forth. If I were to have another tuning fork, and it's going to have the same frequency, it actually could cause this one to vibrate. Now, light, or any electromagnetic wave, is pretty much going to be the same way. Let's just consider my radio tower for a second. If I had an electron, and if I were to wiggle this thing up and down, it's going to have a vibrating source. And what's vibrating now is not air, but the electromagnetic wave, or, but the electric field as it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And if I had an antenna over here with some electrons on it, it, it can cause this guy to vibrate just like that tuning fork is able to vibrate. So what we have is we're going to have a vibrating source that can cause an antenna, if you will, to vibrate. Now let's talk about transparent materials and how light can penetrate these guys. Now suppose I had a chunk of glass, and here I have a chunk of glass that's made up of three atoms. Bear in mind that it's probably made up of billions and billions of atoms, but you know three should serve a purpose. And here I have a chunk of light. So here's going to be my light wave coming in. And we could even call this little teeny tiny packet of light, we could even call this thing a photon. This will be important in a couple of chapters. But you can think of a photon as a chunk of light. Now what's going to happen is we say, well, all glass is, or all of, all of matter is made up of atoms. All atoms have a positively charged nucleus and electrons that kind of live in these shells outside of it. And these shells are kind of like orbits, and there's more than one. And when this light comes in, it's going to be absorbed by the first atom. So you can see it gulp, it swallows it. It excites it. You can see it getting all kind of wiggly and jiggly like here. Now what's really going on is that this electron has actually hopped from an inner shell to an outer shell, but um, it gets all excited. Eventually it's going to spit it back out, so burp, and it spits it out, it passes it to the next atom. So here we have it right here. The next one's going to swallow it. It's going to get all excited. See it right here? Excited. And then it's going to spit it back out. Same thing, going to pass it to the next one. The next one's going to swallow it, and then so on and so forth. So it burps it back out. And at the end of the day, it passes through the glass. And here's my little teeny tiny chunk of light coming out. Um, here is my photon. Now. This just kind of says everything that I said, well, only in text form with a little bit more. So let's talk about this. Transparent materials, how does light go through one of these guys? Well, we're setting electrons um, into vibration. We're exciting them. The energy is absorbed by the atom, and it's going to cause the electrons to vibrate or wiggle, if you will. Now, actually, what I didn't say on the last slide was is the atom actually can do one of two things. It can spit that chunk of light, that photon, back out, or it can absorb it. And since energy is a, a conserved quantity, um, if it absorbs it, it's going to actually cause the glass to um, heat up. If we were to take some clear glass and some colored glass and put them out in the sun, the colored glass is actually going to heat up more than the clear glass because the colored glass is going to absorb more of that energy. Now, if you think about it, if I were to have some glass, and if I were to have one atom, two atoms, three atoms, as the photon energy goes from that one to that one to that one uh, to that one and then right back out, um, this burp, gulp, burp, gulp, burp, gulp type of thing, it takes some time. So as light does this, the light is actually going to slow down as it goes through transparent materials. And this is kind of an important thing to keep in the back of your mind. Now. One thing that is worth mentioning about transparent materials is not all wavelengths are created equal. And if we were to think about glass for a second, something you probably know is that you probably can't get sunburn through glass. Well, what causes sunburn? Well, UV, ultraviolet, is what causes um, sunburn. But ultraviolet actually can't penetrate the glass. The frequencies just don't work out. So it can't really cause the molecules to vibrate. The energy goes somewhere. It goes into actually causing the glass to warm up. Visible light can go through glass. 
and you can kind of see this is wiggling re relatively fast, um, ultraviolet. This is going slow. Infrared is going to wiggle even slower, and it turns out infrared can't penetrate the glass as well. So not all materials are created equal when we talk about transparency. Now, I did mention that as um, we had um, some glass, for example, that it takes some time for our energy from our photon to go from one atom to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And we could even say, how much does it slow down? Well, in a vacuum, we're going to say that the speed of light is going to be equal to C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th. The atmosphere is close enough to a vacuum that, such that it slightly slows um, electromagnetic waves down. But you know what? For physics 102, or even physics 240 some odd, um, it's good enough to say that light travels at the speed of light in the atmosphere. Water is going to slow it down, such that what we're traveling at is going to be 3 quarters times 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Glass is going to slow it down, although the type of glass actually matters. And diamond slows it down to less than half the speed of light. One thing to bear in mind is here we're slowing light down. And again, 3 times 10 to the 8th is going to be the speed of light in a vacuum. This is meters per second. We cannot, cannot, cannot go faster than this. We can slow it down, but we can't go faster. Now, let's really quickly talk about materials that are non-transparent, and we're just going to call these guys opaque, and lots of things are opaque. Um, for example, we're opaque. Um, this is going to be something that absorbs the light, but doesn't re-emit it. So, you know, your physics book, your desk, your chair, people, stuff like that, we're all opaque. We can't see through these guys. These guys are not going to be transparent. What's going to happen is if we were to have a material that is opaque, then we're going, we could have some light coming in, and what's going to happen is that we have some energy. Light um, is going to transmit energy from one place to the other. And the vibration is going to turn this thing into kinetic energy, or more specifically into internal energy. And what this boils down to is for opaque materials to have light shining on them, the temperature is going to go up. Let's think about one opaque material, such as a metal. And metals are actually pretty interesting, especially one that would be shiny, like this surface right here. What's going on with that? Well, lots of metals tend to be shiny, and lots of metals tend to have free electrons. And if we were to have some light coming in at some frequency like this, well, these free electrons can wiggle up and down. So let's pick this guy right here. This guy's going to wiggle up and down at the same rate that this guy is. And actually, it's going to, because it's free, emit something in this direction, because a wiggling electron is going to cause a wiggling electric field, cause a magnetic field. And this is kind of why metals, or shiny metals, um, you can see a reflection in them, because they're emitting light because they have free electrons that can wiggle up and down. Now, let's kind of use this knowledge to explain something that you probably know, but maybe you don't know exactly why it is. Something that you know is, is dry surfaces tend to look light, wet surfaces tend to look dark. And let's talk about why that is. Suppose I were to have the sun, and if I were to have you kind of standing right here looking at the sun, you might see the light that reflects right here. And what's going on is, is the light's going to bounce directly into your eye from the surface. If, however, I were to put a coating of water on top of this, well, what's going to happen is, is we're going to now have this medium, and this medium has a couple of choices. It can reflect it, it can bounce it directly back to your eye, or it can absorb some of it. And as this light goes through this medium now, maybe it's going to bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Every time it hits that surface, it's going to possibly lose some of that energy. It's got more stuff to go through, if you will. And when it bounces back to your eye, it turns out that it's lost some of that energy because some of the energy was absorbed by the water. And wet surfaces are going to look dark, darker than a dry surface. Now let's kind of get some jargon out of the way. Um, any opaque material is going to have a shadow. And if we just had a beam of light, we're just going to call this thing a ray. And if we had some light kind of coming like this, and if we were to put an object right here that is opaque, then essentially right over here, we're going to be in what we're going to call the shadow region, a region where the light rays just pretty much don't reach. Something that is kind of interesting is, is it kind of matters how close or far away the object is from the source as well as the screen you're trying to illuminate it with. 
and if you don't believe me, uh, just get out a lamp and try this. If this orange was relatively close to um, the surface that we're sh um, shining the light on, we're going to see a surface, or we're, we're going to see a shadow, and the shadow is right here, and it's going to have nice, pretty, crisp, clean lines. If this object is really far away, so this one is going to be close, and this one is going to be far, it's also going to produce a shadow, and this is the shadow region where no light um, exists, but it's going to be a lot fuzzier. And we're going to actually put a name to this little teeny tiny fuzzy region right here on the next slide. If we're in a total shadow region, we're going to, go, going to call this uh, an umbra, and the partial shadow, that fuzzy region, is actually called a penumbra. And again, it kind of matters how close an object is to how much penumbra we have versus how much umbra we have. Here we have something that is relatively close. You see a, a vase with some flowers, and you see a nice pretty sharp shadow. You move it further away, and you're going to see a little bit fuzzier. And you move it even further away, really, really, really far away, you see far more penumbra region. This is kind of regions where it's, you know, some light gets there, but not all of the light. So let's kind of finish off by talk about how we see light. Let's talk about um, the eye. Uh, what the eye does is the eye is going to let us perceive light, um, visible light, if you will. And I just want to talk about some of the pieces of it. Um, light's going to come in here through the cornea, which is in um, kind of the transparent cover of your eye. It protects it from all the bad stuff, if you will. And it's going to go through an opening called the iris. And then we have this little lens that's going to go ahead and try to focus this light down onto the back of your eye. Now, the opening of your eye is called the um, pupil, and it can um, dilate and expand as needed to let however much light um, in there that it needs. Um, if it's really bright out, your pupil is, re pupil is relatively small. We don't need a lot of light. But if it's dark out, your pupil gets relatively large because you want to collect as much light as you can. Probably not surprisingly, your pupil is going to be dark because we want it to absorb that light. Dark is a good, or dark things are good absorbers of light. And it's going to go through the lens, and the lens is going to focus the light down onto the back of your eye. And if we want to have good, clear vision, it needs to focus a nice, clear picture on the back. We call the back of the eye um, the retina. And actually, we have one very special region that's called the fovea, and that's going to be the most sensitive part, or the most, or the most sensitive part of the eye, where you have the best vision possible. Now, we do have this nerve, and this nerve is going to carry um, a signal um, to your brain. And where this nerve is, it's actually called the optical nerve, there's going to be a blind spot because where the ner nerve connects right here, um, that we're not going to have any receptors that can receive the light. How do we receive the light? Well, what we actually have on our retinas, we're going to have two things. We're going to have rods and cones. And these guys both are essentially kind of like antennas. And what we could even kind of picture is, is much like a radio antenna, we could have some electrons. And as the light kind of comes in, it's going to wiggle these electrons up and down. And these things can turn this thing into electrical signal, which we then send to the brain. Now, the rods actually handle low light, and they're also going to handle the black and white. And probably not surprisingly, we don't see colors very well when it's low light. We tend to see black and white. Um, the rods do this. Um, the cones actually handle the color vision and the detail, and they tend to be clustered closer to the fovea. One thing to bear in mind is, is when we were, if we were to damage these guys, then unlike our skin, for example, our skin's going to grow back. Um, these guys do not grow back. If you damage your um, retina, then you're essentially damaging it forever. And I know people with laser damage to the eye, and essentially they've lost that piece of it. A couple things to kind of keep in mind, and now we're going from physics more into um, something that's more physiological, seeing light. Um, what does the eye do? What does the brain do? It, now, one thing to bear in mind is, is we're vision, our vision is actually poor at the corner of our eye, but we're sensitive to things that are moving there. And this is probably, you know, for like, you know, tigers creeping up on us when we were like going across the um, African safari and stuff like that. So we can't see very well, but we can see things that are moving relatively well. Now one thing to bear in mind is um, our brain does some post-processing of the image for us, and brightness kind of matters. We have this thing called lateral in inhibition, which means we actually don't perceive differences in brightness, 
and our brain kind of does some post-processing. So here we have something that goes from bright to dark and then bright to dark, and they look kind of different. However, if I were to place this guy right here, then because of what our brain does, we actually have a hard time seeing the difference between the two of these, or at least I do. Again, our brain does some processing. Here we have a line going through some other lines, and I don't know about you, but it looks kind of broken, but in reality, if you were to take a ruler and trace this thing, it's really not. Our brain does some processing for us that can kind of mess with us. Uh, here we have some dashes, here we have some dashes. Um, these guys look like they're different sizes, but in reality, if you were to get out a ruler and measure them on your screen, you would see that they're actually the same size. This is kind of another example of our brain messing with us, and I don't know about you, but you, but if I try to count the black dots, I see a bunch of black dots and white dots that kind of come back and forth. Again, our brain does some post-processing. I want to talk largely about the physics, but keep in mind that our brain, you know, our, our, the, the processing does come into a fat, d does come into account, especially when we talk about like color and stuff. Um, here we have a hat, and ask yourself which one is wider. Obviously, if you were to measure them, they're probably the same. And if you try to read this, you probably see Paris in the spring. But if you read closer, you're going to see Paris in the the spring. So, some things to keep in mind. Are these lines parallel? Are they not? Um, I'll leave this one up to you all.